Good afternoon and welcome to today's Talking Cafe. Most of you will already know me, I am Wendy Rudd. And today I am very fortunate to be joined by um, Philip, Dr Erica, Dr Linda and Roger. And we're going to be talking about lifestyle medicine. To encapsulate it as usual, I have um, done the poem with the help of my sister Jean. Um, so what's today about? We'll give it a quick roundup, as best as my understanding this is, by the way. And it's lifestyle medicine. Lifestyle medicine is here for you, enlightenment and support in all that you do. Empower yourself for that lifestyle change. Doctors Erica and Linda, a radio call can arrange. Whatever your need, help is around for a better lifestyle of which you'll be proud. Fork and knife instruments of hope, health and healing and physical activities will be revealing. Beat diabetes and heart disease or cancer support if that's what you need. Alongside the NHS, a better lifestyle will promote a service we know that will get your vote. Which brings me nicely round into introductions. And we have Philip, Dr Erica, Dr Linda, and Roger. And today, as I say, I have a, a, the biggest team I've ever actually worked with. So this for me is also quite exciting. So mm -hmm. hello, everybody. And thank you very, very much for joining me. Thank you very much for having us. Thank you. Thank really you. appreciate Pleasure. being here, Wendy. Thank you. So Philip, you're going to start us off um, and introduce us to what it is we're about, aren't you? And how we happen to meet, as it were. Yeah, I'm so grateful for people who are tuning in right now on this hot, sunny Thursday. So my name's Philip. I'm the founder and trustee of a Taunton-based charity called Dandelion Seeds Foundation. And we exist primarily for the relief of emotional and physical distress. And I'll be sharing shortly my own personal journey and how this ties into those objects. So we, we provide services, such as what we're going to talk about shortly, lifestyle medicine. We provide grants to individuals and also organizations. And we also intend to provide a, a wide spectrum of complementary approaches that work alongside our wonderful GPs, our wonderful NHS. So we're here to empower our community here in Taunton and Somerset, just to become aware of what other opportunities, almost like doorways, are available for your health and well-being. Today in particular, we're focusing on lifestyle medicine, which in summary is a program that is proven scientifically to reverse chronic disease such as type 2 diabetes, bearing of arteries, and other cardiovascular um, diseases. Um, and this is done mainly through lifestyle changes. So Dr. Erica and Linda will shortly talk about this and Roger's gonna share his experience after me about his journey of encountering lifestyle medicine and where he is today. So my story, why I started the charity is three years ago, I was exhausted, I had symptoms of tingles, I had numbness, I wasn't sleeping. I, I'd get probably two or three hours sleep in the evening because my lifestyle was so pressurized. I started a new business. I have a son with a dual diagnosis of Down syndrome and autism. He's waking up three or four times a day, and I had other pressures externally. I went to see my wonderful GP here based in Taunton, and together, through the intervention of lifestyle medicine, I have now started a charity. I'm able to sleep, I'm able to regulate my emotions, and I'm able just to be more present. So my doorway can become, my my heart is for Somerset, for people who are listening to this, my story can be a doorway for you to be able to reverse your own potential symptoms that you may be experiencing today. So what I'd like to do now, that's my story. I'd like to pass you across to Roger, who will share his story, and then you'll be handed over to Dr. Erica and Linda, who are lifestyle medicine physicians. Okay. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you. Is it my turn to speak now, folks? 
<laughs> I shall, I shall, what I shall do is I shall um, manipulate the screen so that we can actually see you better because you're quite dark there, Roger. Okay, so if you bear with me. There we go. How are we gonna, right, I'll, I'll, where do I start? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you quite a few bits about myself. I'm, I'm a 64-year-old guy, and um, I kind of realised uh, a little while ago that I, I lead a fairly um, hectic lifestyle. I'm retired, but I do quite a lot of things in the community. Uh, and one of them is on your bike, which I feature here. Um, I realised that, you know, I'm a bit tired. I don't sleep well. I'm overweight, what should I do about it? All a bit confusing. And then I hear about some work that Phil's up to. And I'm thinking, hey, this, this might be worth a little look. And then I hear things like, well, you do realize that all of the things you suffer from, Rog, are, you know, that's your lifestyle, mate. They're the choices you made. So I'm thinking, hang on a minute, I need to dig into this a bit deeper. So with Phil's help and the, the Dandelion Seed Foundation, I, I, I did the CHIP program which is the program uh, on, you know, that helps you with your lifestyle choices. And my, oh my, what a transformation. I started it at 16 and a half stone. Um, so, which is actually border, I mean, I'm, my height's not going to change. <laughs> so <laughs> my weight can and my BMI will therefore go down. Um, and, uh, you know, I was exercising quite a lot, uh, walking and particularly in, in bike riding, um, but not in a, not in a, um, a, a controlled fashion, if you see what, if it, that's probably the way of putting it. Um, what was I eating? All sorts. Um, I've got four kids and they're, they're all flown the nest, but, um, you know, quite an influence from two of my, my, my two daughters. They, they've been doing some, um, some eating better than perhaps I did. So I'm thinking I really need to look at this properly. And I've got all of the stats on a, one spreadsheet. So my height, my weight, uh, waist, which was 40 inches, by the way, uh, blood pressure, all of that stuff, which is part of the program. And then I started learning. 70% plus of the whole entire population in this country have, have illnesses that are related to their lifestyle. That staggered me. And I thought, crikey, I'm going to take this a bit more seriously. So I got to look at the plant-based diet. I got to stop things like eating rubbish food, eating at the wrong time of day, um, you know, so all sorts of little things that build up to make a big difference in my life. And I found it fascinating and, and I've learned so much because, I mean, these things you don't get told by the doctor. I thought my doctor was in charge of my health. What a big mistake. I only see them once a year for 15 minutes. How on earth did I think that they were in charge of my, of my, of my health and well-being? Um, you know, it's me. So it, the, the mirror then was right in front of me. Um, and I didn't like what I saw. So I thought, right, come on, I'm going to do this. So I've, I've looked at my, uh, my calorie intake. I've looked at all of that stuff. Um, I've looked at the food I was eating. I've dropped a lot of alcohol, not that I was drinking much. A lot of dairy. Um, chocolate, oh dear, that's quite hard. Cheese, that's hard. Uh, I make my own oat milk. I've certainly a lot more varied diet. I mean, a lot more rainbow stuff. And you'll hear um, uh, people talk about that, I'm sure. Helped massively by being on the program because without it, I wouldn't be able to concentrate. The program took me through 10 weeks of, a, of, a week, of a, an hour in front of a video with others on the same program. Um, and you're accountable to them. It, it helps you with, your, with the way you take, deal with it yourself. So... I mean, what did I learn? Most weeks I learned something new. Food density and energy density of food never, ever entered my head before. One tablespoonful of corn oil, the equivalent of eating lots of corn would be 14 corn cobs. You think, whoa, why am I putting so much corn oil or whatever oil it is in my food? What am I doing that for? Um, you know, so little things that you don't get told by the doctor. My doctor said my BMI was fine, but that's to survive. All the stuff that the doctor was telling me was survival um, numbers. But I thought, hang on a minute, I don't want to just survive. I want to thrive. You know, I want to be dancing the Fandango or whatever when I'm 80, let alone 60. So, you know, what have I got to do? And, and you know, suddenly being, I mean, my aim was to get below 15 stone, which I've done, by the way. But now my aim is to get below or down to 13 and a half stone. 
I haven't been 13 and a half stone since I played, you know, rugby and when I was 16, for goodness sake, and I used to do a lot of sport. But wow, I mean, you know, so I know now the difference between something you thrive for and something you strive at, you know, and get, get really um, fit for. So there are lots of things that I learned. I mean, and it, what's really helpful is if you're doing this with others, you kind of share. You don't have to, but I mean, you can share and say, oh, look, I, I found this new recipe or I'm, I've dropped doing that and I'm really missing chocolate or whatever. And I found that really comforting and helpful. And lots of input from the, from the doctors on the course as well to say, hey, look, Rog, you know, that's, uh, that's normal. Don't worry about it. Yeah, you might feel a bit weird, um, but do you know what? In two weeks your taste buds will change. And loads of different bits of information that help you on that process. All about choices. No one told me what I've got to do. No one told me what I had you know, got to do. What they did was advise me what would be good for me. And that's made a difference. I'm one of those people who's not shy and retiring as you probably just worked out. But I'm, I'm one of those people that doesn't respond well to being told what to do. I have to understand what's beneath it and why I'm doing this stuff. And the beauty of the program is that what it does, it gives you loads and loads of background. You can get lost in the detail of the amount of scientific base behind this. This is not made up stuff. I mean, the two doctors will tell you, you know, they, they see people every single day that are presenting to them. And they've got all of the uh, linear studies and all that science in the background. I even learned the, the chemical formula for fat, human fat, which is C55H10406. I have no idea what that means, really. But um, I'm, I'm going to put it on my T-shirt. Because the only way you can get rid of it, of that stuff, which is killing people, is by eating less and better, not less actually, better, and doing more exercise and moving around a bit more. And if you do those two things, guess what? You get better. You know, we get lied to all the time with the stuff that we put down our necks. And, and it depresses me, actually, a little bit that I've, I've done this for 60, flipping four years. Why have I not known this before? How come I didn't know this stuff? Maybe I did. Maybe I did know bits of it, but nobody really has explained it to me, or I haven't sat down and worked out what it was all about. So a little bit about my story. I want to take it further. I'm aiming to do, I've done a 5K run, I've done a 10K run. I'm going to be running a half marathon this year. I'm aiming to do, and I will be doing the New York Marathon next year. I want to be doing many more bike rides. Uh, I'm, I'm going to train to be a, a walk trainer, uh, and I'm going to do that work. And I'm going to use that as my exercise. I'm being selfish with that, by the way, because I know that that's the way I can you know, sustain my position and my, my health. Um, I've got to commend the pro program to you. It certainly changed a lot of things that I do, and I could bore you to death with it. So I probably – Wendy's giving me the, you better shut up now. No, you're, you have to, I'm impressed. You have questions coming in. Um, Serena is asking, have you made new friends through doing this? Without doubt. I've got new running partners. I joined a thing called the Watch It Whippets, if anybody's out there in West Somerset. I love them. And, uh, my lover is out on, in West Somerset, and, I, and I, so I've gone along to that. Um, and guess what? Two of my running partners have now done the program as well, and what a difference. I mean, a, a, a stunning difference in the uh, appearance and the way they think um, and, and work. Um, I'm also going to be using it, I hope, with Phil's help and with everybody else's help, with all of my uh, on your bike contacts. I'm chair of trustees there, and we, we give people purpose. Um, or help them find purpose again in life and use bikes to do it. So I'm hoping that we can use that the philosophy uh, um, in uh, when, when we talk to our, our, our clients, if you will, and our beneficiaries. So, um, and I run another thing called the Beesum in Taunton, which is um, a charity that helps that supplies um, uh, food to um, in emergency situations. You're well, already I'm, working with village agents with that. Absolutely, aren't you? absolutely. Yes. Yes. I love you, by the way. I love you. And what so, we're doing there, yeah, Wendy, what I'm going to try and do is with, with help from these guys, I'm going to see if we can get better choice foods into the food boxes. Quite a challenge. But oh, if, you look at some, if you look at some of the stuff that we provide people, I would not eat it anymore. I would not. So why are we putting it in food boxes? 
So I'm, you know, there's lots of work coming from this. And have I made friends? Well, I just made another few on here, haven't I, with you guys? I mean, yes, that is true. And your enthusiasm yeah. certainly puts you in the right position to be the champion of the cause. Wow. Tracy has given us a question, but I'm actually going to um, leave Tracy's question to a little bit later because um, I think the GPs can come in and, and look at that one because it's to do with health and they are, by designation, the doctors. So on that, let us bring back... Um, everybody so we're now sort of here and we're going to listen now to what the doctors um are going to um tell us all about and we're going to then have lots of questions and answers so if you have questions please put them up even if you can't stay we can answer the questions and you can view this when it's put up later in uh, facebook and youtube so please don't think that you've missed your opportunity the questions we will work our way through, they will get themselves, even if you are watching this on pre -record, uh, post record, um, we will still be monitoring the site just so that those watching are aware. Okay, thank you, um, Dr. Erica. I believe you're going to start first. Yes, hi everyone. So I'm Erica and I'm a GP from the West Midlands. Um, and my partner, Linda, is an early doctor in Sheffield. And we've also got. Um, Linda's partner, Dr. Adrian, joining us today as well. Um, and uh, Linda and I started Afternoon Tea with Docs last November during the pandemic. And both of us have been increasingly disillusioned with the kind of medical system that we've been working in. It is a disease care system, not a healthcare system. And Linda was actually getting ready to quit medicine I think I was never quite there to, I, I don't think I'll ever have quit medicine, but I was certainly feeling very burnt out from both the workload and also the lack of satisfaction from my work. And before the pandemic, um, earlier um, Roger mentioned the 70% um, statistics, and actually before the pandemic, about 89% of deaths in the UK were caused by chronic diseases. Most of them are actually preventable, but Adrian, Linda and I kept seeing our patients getting sicker and younger and we see them die from these preventable chronic diseases. And when I say chronic disease, I mean conditions like heart disease, stroke, diabetes, cancers and many others as well. So last November, we had just completed our um, international board exam for lifestyle medicine, and we're both regional directors for the British Society of Lifestyle Medicine. And we started talking to each other, and something just clicked when we were talking, and Linda shared with me um, a letter that she wrote to herself, and it was a, a reflection of uh, on the state of our medical system, her vision for health, uh, um, well, her, her vision um, and also her journey to looking for a better way to practice medicine and it felt like the letter just echoed my every thought and we decided together that we were going to create a reality where we would bring healing to our patients and at the same time to rediscover our passion for medicine and this could only be achieved by focusing on health rather than on disease so this means that we would do what we can to prevent disease in the first place. Uh, and for people who have developed these chronic conditions, we would help to educate and empower them to manage and reverse these conditions. Like Roger said, you know, he's in charge of his own health, not his doctor. Um, and um, we, but, but this is a concept that is, quite new to a lot of people. Uh, and this includes healthcare professionals, what reversing chronic diseases that, you know, we're taught in medical school that once you develop these conditions, it's lifelong uh, and you're on medications for life and, and that's it. Um, but the concept of re reversal was never really talked about or um, taught about in medical school. 
But there's actually decades worth of evidence to support this. And the name given to this is lifestyle medicine. And Adrian, Linda and I are all practicing doctors in the NHS. And we and being able to provide care free of charge to our patients is actually really close to our hearts. And so we thought, where would be a good place to start? And we wanted to eliminate the many barriers that we've got in the NHS, um, the, the time limit, the hierarchy, the misinformation, the social inequality. And so we decided to host virtual conversations every week um, that we would actually love to have with our patients in our practice, but it's limited by the time that we've got. Um, and so we named our platform Afternoon Tea with Docs to create a friendly and non-threatening environment where people feel comfortable to converse with us uh, on a weekly basis. Um, and we have created this community where our audience is actually meeting in their own time, sharing cooking tips and recipes to support each other in their health journey, wherever that might be, because we're all at a different starting point and that's okay. And our mission for Afternoon Tea with Docs is to crush chronic diseases by empowering people to regain control of their health through conversations. So one conversation, one cup of tea at a time. Um, and uh, Phil asked me to share with you uh, today what lifestyle medicine is. So before I do that, though, I'd like to ask you a question, just a general audience and, and Wendy, if you could answer this, maybe. Um, I want you to think about a time when you're out on a walk, um, maybe with friends, family, and you find a stone in your shoe. What would you do? Stop and remove the stone. Great. Perfect. Right. You wouldn't think about maybe putting a thicker pair of socks on so you don't feel the stone, would you? No, not at all. No. Or take painkillers so that it's less painful, but just keep no. walking and owning your shoe. And you wouldn't go to your doctor and ask for an amputation to cut off your leg or even the you know nerve supply. That seems way too drastic, doesn't it? It does. Yeah. So many of us would just, well, I think most of us <laughs> would just, you know, lean on the person next to you, take your shoes off, shake out the stone, and then carry on, right? Yeah. And this is exactly what lifestyle medicine is. It is about tackling and treating the root cause of the problem rather than just a symptom. And since the majority of chronic diseases are caused by our modern lifestyle that we have kind of uh, adopted as we adapt to the advances in technologies and also economic growth, somehow convenience has become key in our fast-paced society. And we've come to value that more than looking after ourselves. Um, and we don't see lifestyle medicine as a distinct field of medicine and it's something that should be practiced in conjunction with conventional modern medicine no matter which field you're in whether you're in um, general practice like adrian and myself whether you're in a e like linda um, whether you're a cardiologist uh a, you know a diabetes specialist whether you're a gastroenterologist oncologists even, uh, and surgeons as well. And the unfortunate thing is that actually a lot of people with chronic diseases have resigned themselves to a life that is diminished uh, and that they're leading a lower quality of life. And unfortunately, both the clinicians and patients themselves have come to define them, them by their symptoms rather than by their potential to recover. But our bodies are actually amazing machines and they've been incredibly well designed. So, and if you, give, if you give the body the right conditions, it will, it will heal itself. So just imagine if you're walking in your living room and you bang your leg on a coffee table, it'll get bruised, it'll get red, it'll get a bit swollen and painful. But if you leave it alone, 
it will get better, right? Yeah. But if you keep banging your legs three times a day, every time you walk past that coffee table, um, your leg will never get a chance to heal. Yes, you can maybe go to your doctor, they prescribe some painkillers for you so you can keep banging your leg, but why do you want to do that? Maybe it'll be less, less painful, you might not notice it so much, but that leg itself would never heal. And this is the kind of incomplete approach to medicine that our current system is providing to our patients that we're supposed to be healing. And this act of banging the leg is the lifestyle that we're leading. And this is the kind of how much our body moves, the kind of food that we put in our mouth, the quality and the quantity of sleep that we get at night, whether you smoke, drink, use drugs, um, the amount of stress we're under, and also really importantly, our relationships that we have with other people. And all of these areas are part of what we call lifestyle medicine. So if I was to put, put it very simply, as Dr. Dean Ornish, who is the father of lifestyle medicine says, eat well, move more, stress less, and love more. And I would add here another point that eating well means eating a diet full of colorful, vibrant fruit and vegetables, whole grains, and ideally without processed foods and animal products. And the beauty of this is that it's effective for a multitude of chronic diseases because they all have the same underlying patho pathophysiology, which means the disease process, and they're driven by inflammation. And this inflammation can be reduced if we eat well, move more, stress less, and love more. And there is no one thing, you know, there, there is no one diet for diabetes, one diet for heart disease, one diet for, you know, lung problems. It's the same approach um, because the same approach tackles the underlying root cause of all these problems. And some of you, you might be wondering, what about my genetics? What about it? So my say, okay, my family all died really young from heart attacks and they had bypass surgery um, in their 40s and 50s. Does this mean that I'm also destined to die young from heart attacks or, you know, um, or, or a stroke or something like that? But don't forget, we share a lot more than our genetics with our family. We share the same kitchen. We often share similar habits, environments, communities, attitudes, and many others. And the great news is that studies have shown that you can actually switch on and off more than 500 genes within a 12 week period, just with lifestyle changes. So this means that if you are predisposed or at risk of developing certain diseases because you have a family history of it, you actually have the power to switch these genes on and off through your da the daily choices that you make. So your genetics is definitely not your destiny. And I mentioned earlier that we wanted to create a reality where we bring healing to our patients and along the way, to rediscover our passion for medicine. So um, we're really happy to partner with Dandelion Seeds Foundation, um, thank you, Phil, um, to provide funding um, to, uh, to, to um, provide a funded lifestyle intervention program for people who are at risk of diabetes um, or those who have diabetes. And we are hoping to do this in person in Somerset in the autumn. Um, and if you're interested or know a family or friends who might be interested, I think uh, Kia will be dropping the link uh, to the Express Your Interest form in the chat, um, which is on our website. And of course, if you would like to join us for an afternoon tea one Sunday, we're there every Sunday at five o'clock in the afternoon. All the details are on our website and all the events are free. Um, saying that, we are actually taking a break uh, the first weekend of August. 
um, we rarely do this. <laughs> um and uh and yeah all as i said all of them are free and we just do this in our own time when we're not working in the hospital or in our clinics um and if you want to rewatch and catch up on any of our previous episodes it's all available on youtube as well mm -hmm. if you want to dive in and learn more about lifestyle medicine and how you can take charge of your health and not just to survive but to thrive um, so I'll now hand over to Linda to share her personal story of how she's used lifestyle medicine. Erica, you made me cry. <laughs> but, you know, we went through this the last uh, seven, eight months, and we were so busy every day, but so happy and so overwhelmed with joy um, with what we have been creating, but reflecting back onto our thoughts, our energy, our vision, and hearing that from you has just, you know, filled me with so much joy. And I'm just so happy to be able to work with you and work with all of you guys and to have you in our lives now. Like Phil, thank you. And Wendy, yeah. thank you so much for making this a possibility for all of us and to share yeah. our passions. Uh, what is really so lovely here is, I don't know if you're able to monitor the um, comments box, no. but we are having, um, when you're speaking, when you were speaking, Erica, um, as I was actually thinking, what a fantastic analogy. Somebody has actually come up, Rus Russell's come up and gone, good metaphor. Yeah. Um, Debbie has come in and she's gone, this is amazing. Your passion is shining. Thank you. Um, Kate has put on um, a question of, this all makes perfect sense. How do you envisage getting your wonderful message out there to other primary healthcare and practitioners and GPs? That's something we can pick up later. We've already had a question come in, which we will go back to. Um, and we're only the half hour in. And um, I, you, can, you can just feel that the people that are out there are actually drawn in by your passion before we get Linda's passion, which is equally as amazing as listening to Erica. It's just, it's just, it is just, um, as I said, it, it was going to, I knew it was going to be phenomenal when we spoke earlier. So I shall let you carry on, Dr. Linda. Thank you so much. Thank you, Wendy, uh, for making this a possibility once again. So um, I'm Dr. Linda, emergency medicine physician from Sheffield. And this is my partner, Dr. Adrian, who is a GP. I am. Yes. And uh, we started our journey um, in 2019 in lifestyle medicine through my own illnesses. Uh, for many years, I suffered from um, what first, well, the symptoms were very, very painful abdominal cramps, uh, a lot of diarrhea, uh, bloody, it turned into bloody diarrhea as my training in medicine progressed. My stress levels were going up through the roof. And of course, um, I wasn't really eating or preparing food for just myself. It was um, very time consuming, like for all of us, when we are in a high um, energy job where you have to push it, you know, um, trying to achieve something in your career, you kind of put yourself on the back burner. But on top of that, um, in hospitals, ironically, there is not much access to healthy food and on my night shifts, like just the one that I finished tonight, um, unless I prepared a well-balanced meal, I would have ended up eating, um, drinking milk, dairy, easily accessible, and maybe eating a few cookies from the hospital uh, canteen. Um, so that led me, I guess it sped up my uh, progression with my diseases where I wasn't any longer able to leave my house due to my bowel problems and uh, with Adrian, we sat down to kind of restudy medicine because after taking all these medications, well, I didn't like the taste of my own medicine. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. Uh, I wasn't getting any better. I was just getting more prescriptions. And uh, together we sat down and looked back what we could do better to, um, to get out of this. Um, so we looked at um, whole food plant-based diet. Um, um, back then, lifestyle medicine wasn't even a 
topic because we didn't know it existed. Like most doctors don't know about it, even though we have been right. It was a revelation. Yeah, it was. And we have been both in medicine for over 10 years. Um, and we never heard about lifestyle changes, except the fact that it wasn't a curriculum to suggest to your patients um, that maybe they should eat healthier. But what is healthier? Maybe they should move more. But when should they move more? And what is the equation that is actually supportive for your health? Um, and it's also sustainable in our busy jobs. And was sleep so important? Like, isn't sleep something that we don't even consider mm -hmm. Uh, in our medical field, there's something important, especially since we are always on shifts, shift work. Yeah, agreed. And and I had difficulty with sleep for many years. In fact, I still probably have some difficulty with sleep. But um, lifestyle medicine does look at it very closely and gives us some idea of what we can do about it and why it's important to prioritise sleep. Um, so you're right. I think the medical profession, lots of us, when we're going through our training, uh, we don't sleep very much or we're shifting patterns all the time and that is extremely detrimental to our health now of course some, the nhs needs to provide a 24-hour service and of course emergencies come in at night so someone needs to be on shift um and we're not going to be able to get rid of that but when we're away from that and when we're not on night shifts and when we're not doing those things understanding how uh, important sleep is uh, and prioritizing that on those days that we can get sleep um, is is key and that was important for me and that also led me to lifestyle medicine because I've had well many years of difficulty sleeping because my brain is basically always on it's and always I turned on <laughs> honestly <laughs> it's, it's very good for medicine and to analyze data but <laughs> we have to learn how to relax as well so <laughs> yeah. so we all have all of us I think out in this world and with the current culture have our difficulties in all of these aspects for me certainly it was food and how to eat healthier and always getting mixed messages from everywhere should I eat more protein should I eat more fish is it cheese that I need to eat but in the bottom line um what I noticed is I had I ate too much processed foods uh because it was easily accessible and also because I didn't know how dangerous it is to eat those processed foods um, it's always there. So you think it's normal, right? Uh, but anyways, I ended up uh, having to quit work for a while because I couldn't leave my house anymore. I broke out in impetigo, a skin condition uh, where cephalorous uh, bacteria, like in kids, you might have noticed, seen it, um, they're leaking yellow uh, discharge over the face. I couldn't leave uh, because there was so much inflammation in my body. Um, I had chronic chest infections for many years since uh, I started um, working, actually. Um, I was coughing all the time, nonstop, every single two, three months. I had, would have a two-week break, and then I would be put back on an antibiotics. And there would never be anything on my chest x-ray, but I was coughing and coughing, and the pain was um, getting worse and worse with these many years. So... Um, around 15th of November 2019, we have started to um, implement lifestyle changes as well as cleared our whole kitchen of <laughs> out, <laughs> right? Yeah, we, we essentially transitioned completely to a whole food plant-based diet um, almost overnight yeah. really for us. I know it's that's difficult for many people and we're not saying that everyone can do that, um, but we certainly did. And almost within... A month, maybe probably less than that, really. We started noticing differences in Linda's um, abdominal symptoms. She was getting less pain. Uh, she was more regular. I mean, she wasn't passing blood anymore. She was feeling better, feeling more energetic, was able to cycle more. Um, mine was probably less noticeable because I didn't have those issues beforehand. But knowing what I knew from all the reading encouraged me to do the same thing. But seeing it in Linda was, was certainly it was dramatic, really. And now, really, she only gets these skin conditions, this skin issue, when, for instance, she's on nights and she can't eat properly. She can't look after herself um, as best as she would like to. Mm. And if she does a, a weak run of nights, then she, suddenly she gets this skin condition back again. Her stomach goes off. Um, and it just shows you how rapidly things can improve um, with uh, lifestyle changes. Absolutely. And now it's two years on. I haven't um, had 
I, I was the COVID doctor. So I was in recess all the time. Uh, from the beginning, when we didn't know COVID existed, um, I was in recess taking care of the uh, respiratory patients. Um, we were intubating them. I was always in the front line. Um, so in the beginning, we didn't have FFP3s, masks, and all the clothing, um, protective gear, but uh, I never got sick. And I wouldn't want to know what would have happened to me if um, I didn't transition. I didn't get my immune system strong before COVID hit, uh, because we know well those who are having a lot of inflammation, uh, a lot of health uh, problems, chronic diseases, diabetes, um, obesity, heart disease are the ones who unfortunately got the, the disease, um, got the infection much worse. Uh, but in over one and a half years now, being on the front line, I touch wood, uh, nothing has happened to me and I haven't taken a day off sick since. So <laughs> that's, that's our story, how we transitioned and why we're so passionate about it because we know that people don't have to be sick, right? So seeing everyday people uh, on our tables, like in a &E, uh, suffering from chronic diseases and their acute effects like a dissection or a heart attack or the side effects of diabetes or needing amputations, chronic infections that get worse when they come in a &E. And we know that these diseases could be prevented, right? Right, yeah. I, I do think um, a lot of that is education, not just education for patients, but education for doctors, um, just so they understand what lifestyle medicine is about. Um, I do also think we need to expand that out a little bit more and understand that um, there are there are other things that influence why people eat how they eat, um, how why they live how they live, and it might be um, their environment around them, their social norms. It might be that they don't have enough money to buy appropriate food, and there's a there's a bigger economic reason why people might eat what they do because for some reason processed junk food is cheaper than buying healthy good food, and that's that's a problem with how we trade things and uh, and and how economics works and that needs to be looked at and subsidies as well given to things that are, are, are generally you know more unhealthy for us um so those are things that also need to be looked at on top of this lifestyle medicine approach there is a bigger economic picture as well that needs to be seen um so apart from obviously improving people's health um it's great for the environment when you transition to a whole food plant-based diet and you know planetary health needs this right now greenhouse gases climate change and changing your diet to do this not only impacting would impact your health it's probably the single biggest thing you can do to help the environment as well um, and you may have read in the news this week there, there was a news about the permafrost in uh, in Alaska that's starting to melt and that might and as that melts uh, the the debris under there or the soil and the plant life under there will uh, start to decay because the microbes will start to eat that and it will release something like 1,400 gigatons of carbon dioxide and methane into the atmosphere. Um, and that, you know, that's more than one and a half times what's in there already, which is going to raise uh, planetary temperatures as well. So how do we combat that part as well? And looking at that part, well, our diet is probably this one of the single biggest things we can look at immediately to try and prevent that. What is amazing about it is that we are all connected, all as a society, as a community, and if we, as well as with our planet, we live on on this planet. So without it, we kind of don't exist, right? Uh, it's simple as that. But um, what's good for our own health is really good for our planet as well. And it just makes sense. Uh, we are all in harmony and synergy. Uh, so it's super important to to look at what we can do for both. So, I mean, we we could talk about this forever, and I, I definitely feel a series coming on. Um, we're going to want some time for questions and things. So, as I say, the fact that you have my undivided attention, because as a diabetic, when we spoke earlier and we were discussing the format, how we were going to do things, I had so much education that I was absolutely flawed because for several years now, as you, you asked me a basic question and I actually didn't know the answer. Um, and having been diagnosed, having been treated, and I think that is what it is, as you say, 
convenience food is easy because it's convenient and we all lead busy uh, lifestyles. So yes, that has been the go-to. But what I'd identified today, since actually talking to you, I had a look on something I bought, which I thought was good because I have been making changes. And you said processed food. And yet the back of it reads amazing. It's all good, wholesome stuff. But it is processed. It's not go it, go it yourself. Um, we have a question from Tracy, who was one of our earliest viewers. Um, and she has asked, uh, she says, I have ME and fibromyalgia and don't know what kind of exercise to do for weight loss has been her question. So whether or not you could um, give a, a, an answer to that one um, would be very good. I, I think that's probably quite a difficult question to answer um, without an individual discussion because it really depends where she is on that journey and how much exercise she can do already. And obviously going too far with exercise can drain you for the next day and, and beyond that and make it very difficult. Um, so it's really about seeing what you can do now and, and just small steps, even things like you know, it might be stretching, it might be walking, it might be using elastic bands, um, doing some form of resistance exercise, getting on the yoga mat and doing some kind of stretching exercise every day might be all you can manage. Um, but it's also looking at these other things that might contribute to your energy levels at the same time. So things like we were talking, your diet, eating a, eating a really good diet, a whole food plant-based diet, um, looking at things, are you drinking alcohol? Are you smoking? Are you, are you prioritizing your sleep? Um, and and there, there's also other things in there, things like, are you taking a vitamin D supplement? Because lots of people should be taking vitamin D and vitamin B12 to improve their tiredness symptoms. That, that might all... Uh, be contributing and helping you do more exercise. So they're all interlinked. And I think it's really lo about looking at where you are right now, how you can either maintain that or perhaps push it a tiny bit further, but don't go too hard because it can drain you for the, the following day and the following week. Uh, but looking at these other things as well and how you can improve those and optimize those. And that may well uh, improve your exercise capacity and your recovery time uh, after um, doing, doing that exercise. Thank you. Um, I'm going to come in with what I think is a basic question. And as I say, I'm quite clever and understand what I'm being told, et cetera, et cetera. And it's the word is the use of the word carbohydrate. When you go to your GP, when you get advice from your diabetic nurse or whoever, and they talk about diet, the word carbohydrate is used. And having spoken with you earlier, it's a word that is misused, I'm going to say, because it, for the majority of people, it conjures up the white bread, the pasta and everything else. And it is understanding, as you say, on the diet when they say, stop eating carbohydrate. And then they say, you can have pasta. And you think, hang on, how can I have pasta if I'm not doing carbohydrates so and you actually gave me a wonderful clarification on the word carbohydrate would you like to and i'm going to let you say it because you'll say it far better than i will because you have a much better understanding of it linda you do you, do you want to share that because uh, you explained that to to wendy earlier well, I'm going to pass it on to, to Adrian then. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I think describing things as a single term, like don't eat carbohydrates or watch your carbohydrates. There are many different, there's, there's refined carbohydrates where all the goodness is taken out of it. And there's uh, other types of carbohydrates, which might be the healthy kinds, such as fiber in, in a whole food plant-based diet. Um, and that fiber is a carbohydrate. So when you eat vegetables, those things are carbs. So um, I think really when we're talking about carbs, it should be qualified um, by is this, are we talking about refined carbs or free sugars? Or, or are we talking about carbohydrates that are in vegetables and fruits um, and legumes like beans and pulses and those kind of things, which actually are good carbohydrates uh, for a number of different reasons, i.e. they help you 
um, improve your your glycemic control if you're a diabetic and, and if you're not a diabetic as well um, it does have some effects on blood pressure um, it's important for it's an important fuel for our microbiome in our gut which ferments that and breaks that down into important chemicals which um, improve the health of our gut but also have other um, really good effects in our body as well um, yes, it's so important uh, to talk about fiber and getting familiar with that term, right, Erica? How many, how many, how many grams of fiber do we eat in the Western diet? Something I think in the UK, something like eighteen grams on average, something like that. But we should be eating at least, you know, thirty plus grams. I think that that's being modest, thirty. Um, and um, people who are on a whole food plant-based diet probably eat a good 50, 60 grams of, of fiber easily. Uh, and um, fiber is, it, like Adrian said, it's really important fuel for our microbiome. Yes, we, we, don't, um, we can't digest the fiber, but our microbiome feeds on that. Um, and they need that fuel to provide us with, you know, good immunity um, and um, reducing inflammation and our microbiome is also connected to our mental health um, and how much calories you extract from the food that you eat, all of these things. And actually, um, microbiome also, the, the bacteria forms the bulk of our, our stools as well. So if you don't eat enough fiber, the good microbes aren't growing, and you have less bulk in your in your stools, you're not cleaning the toxins out of your of your bowel. And we've known for a long, 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 long time, that fiber is important in preventing colon cancer. But actually, fiber does a lot more than just preventing colon cancer. Absolutely, it's crucial. And it is definitely modest, 30, 30 grams. Um, it's about uh, 80 grams and above. And um, if you have heard of blue zones, areas where people are centenarians, and not only centenarians, but they live a healthy uh, uh, life for 100 plus years. So they don't get chronic disease by age 70 and then they struggle the next 20 years if they are lucky. But so in these blue zones, uh, people are eating about 80 to uh, minimum 80 grams of fiber a day. Um, so that's why it's crucial to um, change your diet from a heavy meat and um, uh, animal based products as well, because every time you eat a little bit of a steak, it's really high in calorie, right? Really, really high in calorie, but it doesn't have the phytonutrients and phytochemicals that our bodies need as medicine to uh, keep us healthy and zero fiber and zero fiber like it has nothing in it except saturated fat um, and of course uh, we often talk about b12 vitamin so where where do i get b12 vitamin from if i don't eat meat uh, well we know well now that b12 vitamin actually wendy um do you know where b12 comes from because that comes into the uh, question quite often I should do, but I cheat and I have nutritional yeast. <laughs> That's very good. Um, I, I sprinkle nutritional yeast on um, my soups and things like that. So I know I get my B12 from there because, no, I don't know where B12 comes from. Excellent. And Phil, do you know where B12 comes from? Where is where, What makes B12? I have a very simplistic view. If you look at gorillas, they're strong, they're lean, and they're vegetarian. So they obviously <laughs> eat B12 in their diet. So I could come up with a whole host, but I, you'd have to answer that. I'm not entirely sure. So I'm sure it comes from green leafy spinach. I'd imagine legumes. I imagine it comes from kale and other. Sort of, I, I look at the color spectrum, and I think green is a go-to. So my guess, if I was guessing, I'd say spinach, kale, so, uh, so plant -based products. there is always the greens are wonderful and you can list them and i will listen here all day long and i will be full of joy to to hear but b12 vitamin actually um 
is, is a misconception. It doesn't come from the animal meat. It actually comes from the ground, from the bacteria, a bacteria that produces B12 vitamin. And that bacteria, while the animal, the cow grazes, um, goes into the cow and so we have it. But nowadays, because of agricultural changes, um, that bacteria doesn't exist anymore. Hmm. So how do we get B12 vitamin now through our animals, you might ask? I bet they give it artificially. Yes, they inject the, the animal. Yeah. They inject the animal, the cow, with B12 supplements so that it can, and, it, and not all of the animals actually. So there's a misconception that all animals have B12 in them, so we should eat a large amounts so we are, don't get deficient. But I think all, a lot of your patients in Doncaster and also mine, they are quite low on B12 vitamin, it's aren't quite, they? It's quite common. I think, yeah, I think it's worth remembering that we are getting biodiversity loss in the soils which is affecting the bacteria and the amount of bacteria that can actually produce this B12, which animals eat, and then it sequesters into them, and then people eat the animals and they get B12. Um, but that, yeah, that is definitely declining, and the amount of B12 in animals is declining, um, and therefore even animal eaters and plant eaters alike probably need to start take, looking at B12 supplements. Um, and equally, if you, for instance, the way we treat things like diabetes, so if you're on metformin, that, that affects the way that we absorb B12. So you may actually get low B12 because you're on metformin for diabetes. So um, so yeah, I, I think really looking at, uh, at B12 is important. Almost everyone really should be should be on some kind of B12 along with vitamin D as well, mm -hmm. um, because vitamin D is, is made through the, uh, our getting exposed to sunlight um, uh, on our skin for 10, 15 minutes every day is, is, is necessary. Um, you can get it from some plants as well. Mushrooms are a good source of, of vitamin D, but it's a different kind of vitamin D. However, mushrooms in the UK are grown in the dark and uh, mushrooms actually need to be put in the sunlight to actually make vitamin D. So if you're going to eat mushrooms and you want vitamin D, stick them in the sun for a bit and then cook them and you'll get some vitamin D. Do you know, I heard that last week. Funny Did you? enough, pop them on your windowsill the day before you're going to eat them so they can soak up the vitamin D. Exactly. Exactly. Right. We, do, we do have a question from um, Debbie. Mm -hmm. Let's pop the last question in. Um, will lifestyle medicine help with menopause symptoms? <laughs> I, I can offer an answer to that unless I know someone else wants to answer. Um, so um, obviously there's other, th there's, there's lots of uh, things you can do um, for, but if we're just going to talk about diet, there's been a, a, a new paper that's come out by Neil Bernard and et al, uh, looking at the effects of soya on menopausal symptoms and showing that it does reduce things like what we call vasomotor symptoms, which is the hot flashes. And really that's why we prescribe things like HRT, um, because HRT is, 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 uh, is actually an estrogen, it might have some progesterone in it, but it's a low dose of estrogen to try and combat those uh, hot flashes, which you get as your estrogen levels decline, as the ovaries start to uh, decline in their estrogen production. Um, so they looked at um, eating a cup, I think it was half a cup or a cup of soya every day, and it did significantly reduce hot flushes. Um, and the reason for that is because of um, particular types of uh, plant hormones, um, uh, which mimic estrogen, phytoestrogens they're called, um, and they basically act on similar receptors to your normal estrogen in your body, uh, but they act slightly differently, i.e. they are pro-estrogenic, estrogenic in some tissues, and they're anti-estrogenic in other tissues. So they actually protect your bones, um, but they also can block these, or they look like they can block these hot flushes Interestingly, I just want to add on top of that, is that they found that certain people um, got a greater effect from this soya than others. And they actually thought that it might be because one of the chemicals called daidzine is broken down into another chemical called equal, which is very, which is quite effective at blocking these hot flushes. And it's broken down by your gut microbiome. So they found that people that ate a whole food plant-based diet had changed their microbiome to be able to create equal from this soya product. And 
you should also be aware that you can change your own microbiome. So even if you've been eating meat for years and years and years, if you do two to four weeks of eating um, a, a powerful plant-based diet, you'll start to change your gut microbiome. Um, and so you might find that things like soya products will be more effective in menopausal symptoms if you do that. Um, and just to add to that as well, we are on afternoon tea with docs. We interviewed a lady, um, Annette, quite a few months ago, uh, and she's on a whole food plant based diet. And she had a, a gynecological um, condition. And when we asked, she transitioned on a uh, onto a whole food plant based diet. And when we asked her what side effects she had, uh, and one of the side effects she said was that she basically had hardly any symptoms throughout her menopause. Um, uh, what, and uh, and also her hay fever symptoms were completely gone. Um, so um, these are some good side effects from a whole food plant based diet that you won't get from your uh, medicines, uh, the pills that you take. We've now um, reached the time limit. So um, I want to say thank you very much because as you say, we've we've skimmed the surface. Um, all of your contacts and how to get hold of you and for people to learn more and to join you will all be um, in the comments boxes in, and that will be monitored. Anything that comes through that we can obviously answer if it's as straightforward as an address and how to contact, any queries that come through, we will make sure they get to the right person. Um, and I, I've written down here when we were talking earlier on one of my notes, and I think it's really good to uh, end with, um, was uh, what was said earlier, there is hope because we can make the changes ourselves. And that about, for me, sums it up. Um, I am now feeling so much more positive. And yes, I'm going to be joining your tea time sessions and I'm going to be asking you other questions and moving myself forward. Philip has already um, got me lined up as a champion. Um, and it just leaves me to now for you to give us your pearl of wisdom before you, we have to say goodbye to you all. Well, could I, could I just briefly add, we are looking to run for residents only of Somerset, um, the Lifestyle Medicine course beginning in October. So if anyone is resonating with what we're saying it is limited to 24 places currently but if you submit an inquiry if you're just interested in knowing a bit more to at tea with a doctor then they can at least keep you updated on progress okay that's lovely thank you erica do you have a oh pearl of wisdom or I just, just... <laughs> i i i would borrow Dean Ornish's words and say, eat well, move more, stress less and love more. Brilliant answer. <laughs> and Linda and Adrian. I'll let you do that one. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to hear yours as well. Um, I think what we learned is is genetics are not our destiny, as uh, Dr. Esselstyn says. And it couldn't be truer because we can take control of our health and it only takes a few weeks to change um, your overall health around, um, including our, your mental health. There, is, there can be progress in a very short period of time. So it's a very uh, empowering uh, time right now that we are really excited about. And if we can be of a little help here, then um, we are on it. Thank you very much. Wendy, just really quick, for the, our audience, I'd like to say this is an opportunity in terms of retirement to put a new tire on, retire for a new journey for your life. And that would really be my heart for the residents of Somerset. I'm glad you got that one in, Philip, because I do love that saying myself. OK, um, and thank you all very, very much. And as I say, no doubt this is the beginning of a journey we've got together. Um, we look forward to talking to you in the future as your word spreads. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you. Thank you. 
And that just leaves me to thank the audience. Um, and I hope you've enjoyed the conversations and the chats as much as I have. And I look forward to seeing you again in the future. And don't forget next week, Tuesdays, Wednesdays and Thursdays, 1pm, there's always a talking cafe. Goodbye for now.